Thank you for watching this collection of 12 lessons on how to start and run a business. Each lesson consists of proven strategies that produce results. We hope you enjoy them and put them into practice and that your business venture enjoys great success. Please subscribe to our channel so that you do not miss any of the great videos we create for entrepreneurs like you. Now let's get started. Here is the list of the 12 lessons. How to start your own business, 10 steps you need to follow. Thank you for watching this video. Hang on and take notes as we get started. Hello and welcome to our video on how to start your own business, 10 steps you need to follow. Starting a business is a thrilling and fulfilling experience, but it can also be daunting and challenging. In this video, we will discuss some key steps and strategies you need to know to start your own business. Step 1. Identify your business idea. The first step in starting a business is identifying your business idea. You need to identify a gap in the market that your business can fill. This could be a product or a service. Conduct market research to identify the needs and wants of your target customers. For example, let's say you want to start a coffee shop. You need to research the local coffee shops in your area, the types of coffee they offer, their prices, and the level of customer service they provide. This will help you identify the gaps in the market and how you can differentiate your business from competitors. Step 2. Develop a business plan. Once you have identified your business idea, you need to develop a business plan. This plan will act as a roadmap for your business and will help you stay focused on your goals. Your business plan should include your business objectives, marketing plan, financial projections, and a SWOT analysis. A SWOT analysis will help you identify the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of your business. For example, if you are starting a new restaurant, your business plan should include a detailed analysis of the local competition, target customers, menu, pricing strategy, staffing, and marketing strategy. Step 3. Register your business. Once you have developed your business plan, you need to register your business. This involves choosing a business name, registering your business with the government, and obtaining any necessary licenses and permits. For example, if you want to start a food truck business, you need to register your business with your local government and obtain a food license. In addition to this, you need to obtain necessary permits, such as a health permit and a business license. Step 4. Secure Funding Starting a business requires funding. You need to secure funding for your business by exploring different funding options such as loans, grants, and investors. For example, you can explore funding options such as crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, or you can approach angel investors who are interested in investing in startups. You can also consider applying for small business loans from banks or government-sponsored programs. Step 5. Build your team. Your team is a critical component of your business. You need to build a team that can help you achieve your business objectives. Hire individuals who have the skills and expertise you need to run your business successfully. For example, if you want to start a software development company, you need to hire individuals with programming skills, marketing skills, and project management skills. You can find potential hires through online job postings, referrals, or by attending job fairs and networking events. Step 6. Establish your online presence. In today's digital age, establishing an online presence is essential for any business. Create a website, social media profiles, and online directories for your business to increase your visibility and reach. For example, if you are starting a new e-commerce business, you should create a website and social media profiles to promote your products and services. You can also list your business on online directories such as Yelp, Google My Business, and TripAdvisor to increase your visibility. Step 7. Set up your accounting system. Establishing an accounting system is essential to keep track of your business finances. Choose an accounting software that meets your needs and set up a system to manage your income and expenses. For example, you can use accounting software such as QuickBooks, Xero, or FreshBooks to manage your business finances. Step 8. Launch your business. Now that you have completed the necessary steps, 
it's time to launch your business. This involves implementing your marketing plan, reaching out to potential customers, and generating revenue. For example, if you are starting a home cleaning business, you can start by offering your services to family and friends and asking for referrals. You can also market your business by creating flyers and distributing them in your local community. Step 9. Monitor your progress. As your business grows, it's important to monitor your progress and make necessary adjustments to your business plan. Track your finances, marketing strategies, and customer feedback to identify areas where you can improve. For example, you can use key performance indicators, KPIs, such as revenue growth, customer retention rates, and website traffic to monitor the progress of your business. You can also collect customer feedback through surveys and social media to identify areas where you can improve your products or services. Step 10. Stay motivated and continue learning. Starting a business can be challenging, but it's important to stay motivated and focused on your goals. Surround yourself with positive influences and continue learning and growing your skills. For example, you can attend industry conferences, networking events, and online courses to learn new skills and stay up to date with industry trends. You can also join a business mentorship program to receive guidance and support from experienced entrepreneurs. Key takeaways. Starting a business can be a challenging and rewarding experience. By following these key steps and strategies, you can increase your chances of success and achieve your business objectives. Remember to stay motivated, stay focused, and never stop learning. Good luck! Thank you for watching this video. We hope that it has been helpful. Please like, comment, and share. We also invite you to subscribe to our channel so that you do not miss any of the videos we create especially for entrepreneurs like you. 10 Reasons Businesses Fail, Mastering the Art of Business Survival Thank you for watching this video. Hang on as we get started. Hello and welcome to this video on 10 Reasons Businesses Fail, Mastering the Art of Business Survival. Over the years, we have all seen many businesses come and go. We have identified the top 10 reasons why businesses fail. In this video, we'll explore each of these reasons in depth, with real-life examples and corroborating evidence from high-quality sources of information. Our intention is that by bringing these factors to light, aspiring entrepreneurs and business owners will have the opportunity to reflect on how their own business is being managed, try to avoid these pitfalls, and master the art of survival. So, let's get started. Point 1. Lack of market demand. The first reason why businesses fail is a lack of market demand. No matter how great your idea is, if there is no market demand for it, your business will struggle to survive. Many entrepreneurs fall in love with their own ideas and fail to do proper market research. As a result, they end up investing a lot of time and money in a product or service that nobody wants. For example, in 2018, e-cigarette company Juul announced that it was discontinuing the sale of some of its flavored pods due to declining sales. The company had previously been criticized for marketing its products to young people, but even after changing its marketing strategy, it was unable to overcome the declining demand for its products. This highlights the importance of understanding market demand and adapting to changes in consumer behavior. Point 2. Poor cash flow management. The second reason why businesses fail is poor cash flow management. Cash flow is the lifeblood of any business, and if you can't manage it properly, your business will suffer. Many entrepreneurs make the mistake of confusing profit with cash flow and fail to anticipate the timing of their cash inflows and outflows. This can lead to a situation where a business is profitable on paper, but has no cash to pay its bills. According to a study by U.S. Bank, 82% of businesses fail due to poor cash flow management. In 2019, fashion retailer Forever 21 filed for bankruptcy due in part to poor cash flow management. The company had expanded too quickly and had too much debt, leading to a situation where it was unable to pay its bills on time. This highlights the importance of effective cash flow management to ensure the financial health of your business. Point 3. Ineffective Marketing The third reason why businesses fail is ineffective marketing. You may have a great product or service,
but if you can't effectively market it, nobody will know about it. Many entrepreneurs make the mistake of relying on word-of-mouth marketing or social media alone, without investing in a comprehensive marketing strategy. For example, in 2019, meal kit delivery company Blue Apron saw a decline in revenue and a loss of subscribers due in part to ineffective marketing. The company had relied heavily on television ads, which proved to be expensive and ineffective in reaching its target audience. This highlights the importance of developing a comprehensive marketing strategy that takes into account the unique needs and behaviors of your target audience. Point 4. Poor Management The fourth reason why businesses fail is poor management. A business can have the best products and services in the world, but if it is poorly managed, it will not succeed. Many entrepreneurs lack the necessary management skills and fail to hire the right people to help them run their businesses. According to a study by CB Insights, 23% of startups fail due to poor management. One example of poor management is the downfall of Toys R Us. The company filed for bankruptcy in 2017 due in part to poor management decisions, such as taking on too much debt and failing to invest in e-commerce. This highlights the importance of effective management and leadership to ensure the long-term success of your business. Point 5. Lack of Innovation the fifth reason why businesses fail is a lack of innovation. In today's fast-paced business environment, it's not enough to simply have a good product or service. You need to continually innovate and adapt to changing market conditions in order to stay ahead of the competition. One example of a company that failed to innovate is Blockbuster. The video rental giant was once a dominant force in the industry, but it failed to adapt to changes in technology and consumer behavior. As a result, it was unable to compete with newer, more innovative companies like Netflix, and filed for bankruptcy in 2010. Point 6. Failure to Pivot The sixth reason why businesses fail is a failure to pivot. Even if you have a great product or service, you may need to pivot your business model in order to adapt to changing market conditions or take advantage of new opportunities. Many entrepreneurs are hesitant to pivot their businesses either because they are too attached to their original idea or because they fear failure. One example of a company that successfully pivoted is PayPal. Originally founded as a company that provided security software for handheld devices, PayPal pivoted to become a digital payments company after recognizing the potential of e-commerce. This pivot allowed the company to grow rapidly and eventually be acquired by eBay for $1.5 billion. Point 7. Legal Issues The seventh reason why businesses fail is legal issues. Running a business comes with a wide range of legal and regulatory requirements, and failing to comply with them can have serious consequences. Many entrepreneurs make the mistake of ignoring or downplaying legal issues, which can lead to fines, lawsuits, and even criminal charges. One example of a company that faced legal issues is Uber. The ride-hailing company has faced numerous legal challenges around the world, including accusations of violating labor laws, discrimination, and unsafe driving practices. These legal issues have cost the company billions of dollars in fines and settlements, highlighting the importance of compliance with legal and regulatory requirements. Point 8. Lack of Scalability The eighth reason why businesses fail is a lack of scalability. If your business is unable to scale up to meet increasing demand, you may miss out on opportunities to grow and expand. Many entrepreneurs fail to plan for scalability and end up with businesses that are unable to keep up with demand. One example of a company that struggled with scalability is Twitter. The social media platform was unable to handle the rapid growth of its user base in the early days, leading to frequent crashes and downtime. This highlighted the importance of planning for scalability and investing in the necessary infrastructure to support growth. Point 9. Economic Factors The ninth reason why businesses fail is economic factors. Economic downturns, inflation, and changes in government policies can all have a significant impact on businesses, and those that are not prepared may struggle to survive. Many entrepreneurs fail to plan for economic downturns and do not create contingency plans to keep their businesses afloat during difficult times. One example of a company that struggled during an economic downturn is General Motors. 
During the 2008 financial crisis, the auto industry was hit hard, and General Motors was forced to file for bankruptcy. This highlights the importance of planning for economic factors and having contingency plans in place to ensure the survival of your business. Point 10. External factors. The final reason why businesses fail is external factors. These can include natural disasters, pandemics, or other unexpected events that can have a significant impact on businesses. While it may be impossible to predict or prevent these events, businesses that are well prepared are better able to weather the storm. One example of a company that struggled with external factors is Kodak. The photography company was unable to adapt to the shift towards digital photography and was hit hard by the 2008 economic crisis. However, the final nail in the coffin was the rise of smartphones with high-quality cameras, which rendered traditional cameras and film obsolete. Kodak was unable to adapt to this new reality and filed for bankruptcy in 2012. In conclusion, there are many reasons why businesses fail, and it's important for entrepreneurs to be aware of these factors and take steps to prevent them. By focusing on key areas like financial management, market research, innovation, and scalability, you can increase your chances of success and avoid common pitfalls. Additionally, it's important to be flexible and adaptable, and to always be willing to pivot your business model or strategy if necessary. Finally, it's important to stay up-to-date on legal and regulatory requirements, economic factors, and external events that could impact your business, and to have contingency plans in place to mitigate the risk of failure. Thank you for watching this video. We hope that you have enjoyed it and found it useful for your current or future business plans. We invite you to like, comment, and share the video, and also to subscribe to our channel so that you do not miss any of the other videos we have created for entrepreneurs like you. How to validate your business idea before launching. Hang on as we get started. Hello and welcome to this video on How to validate your business idea before launching. If you're an entrepreneur or small business owner, you know how important it is to have a solid business idea that can withstand the test of time. However, before you invest your time and money into your business idea, it's crucial to validate it to ensure that it's viable and has the potential to succeed in the marketplace. In this video, we'll discuss some important steps that you can take to validate your business idea before launching. So, let's get started. Step 1. Research your target market. The first step in validating your business idea is to research your target market thoroughly. You need to identify the needs and wants of your potential customers, their preferences, buying habits, and demographics. By doing so, you'll be able to understand your target market better and tailor your product or service to meet their needs. For example, let's say you want to launch a mobile app for health and fitness enthusiasts. You'll need to research your target market to find out what features they would like to see in the app, what motivates them to exercise, and what type of content they prefer. You can use online surveys, focus groups, and interviews to gather this information. According to a survey by Statista, the top reasons why people exercise are to improve their health, to feel better about themselves, and to reduce stress. Knowing this information, you can create an app that focuses on these benefits and addresses the pain points of your target market. Step 2. Analyze your competitors. The second step in validating your business idea is to analyze your competitors. You need to find out who your competitors are, what they offer, their strengths and weaknesses, and what makes them stand out in the market. By doing a competitive analysis, you can learn from their successes and failures and identify opportunities for your business. You can also use this information to differentiate yourself from your competitors and offer something unique to your target market. For example, let's say you want to launch a meal delivery service. You'll need to research your competitors, such as Blue Apron, HelloFresh, and Freshly. You can analyze their pricing, menu options, delivery times, customer service, and customer reviews to identify areas where you can improve and differentiate your service. According to a survey by Nielsen, convenience is the top reason why people use meal delivery services. Knowing this, you can offer more convenient delivery options or a wider range of menu options to appeal to your target market. Step 3. Create a minimum viable product. 
The third step in validating your business idea is to create a minimum viable product, MVP. An MVP is a basic version of your product or service that has enough features to satisfy early customers and validate your idea. By creating an MVP, you can test your idea in the market and gather feedback from your customers. For example, let's say you want to launch a new online course on digital marketing. Instead of creating a full course with all the modules, you can create a basic version with one or two modules and offer it to a small group of beta testers. You can then gather feedback from them and improve the course before launching it to a wider audience. According to Eric Ries, the author of The Lean Startup, creating an MVP is a crucial step in validating your business idea. It allows you to test your hypothesis and get feedback from real customers before investing too much time and money into your idea. Step 4. Use landing pages to test interest. The fourth step in validating your business idea is to use landing pages to test interest. A landing page is a standalone web page designed to promote a specific product or service. By using landing pages, you can test your business idea with your target market and gauge their interests before fully launching your product or service. For example, let's say you want to launch a new line of organic skincare products. Instead of investing a lot of money into manufacturing and distribution, you can create a landing page that showcases your products and collects email addresses of people who are interested in learning more. You can then use these email addresses to follow up with potential customers and get feedback on your product. According to HubSpot, landing pages are a powerful tool for validating your business idea. They can help you test your value proposition, understand your customers' pain points, and validate your pricing strategy. Step 5. Evaluate your results. The final step in validating your business idea is to evaluate your results. You need to look at the data you've collected from your research, competitive analysis, MVP, and landing pages to determine whether your business idea has potential in the market. If your results show that there is significant interest in your product or service, you can move forward with confidence and invest more resources into your business idea. However, if your results show that there is little interest or too much competition, you may need to reevaluate your business idea or pivot to a new direction. For example, let's say you've followed all the steps and launched your product, but sales are not meeting your expectations. You can use the data you've collected to analyze your sales funnel, identify areas where you're losing customers, and make changes to improve your conversion rates. Conclusion In conclusion, validating your business idea is a critical step in launching a successful business. By researching your target market, analyzing your competitors, creating an MVP, Using landing pages to test interest and evaluating your results, you can increase your chances of success and reduce the risks associated with launching a new business. Remember, validating your business idea is an ongoing process that requires continuous feedback and adjustment. By staying open to feedback and willing to pivot, you can refine your idea and create a successful business that meets the needs of your customers. Thank you for watching, and we hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips on digital marketing and business development. This video examines the seven common business types. Are you interested in starting a business? Learn the basics of the seven different business structures that can be set up. The restrictions of a small business's operations are significantly influenced by its structure. Business structures specify who can own the company, who is responsible, and what taxes are due. To meet state-specific filing requirements, the objective of the business must be established prior to registration and establishment. The seven business categories listed below can help you create your small business structure. 1. Sole Proprietorship A sole proprietorship small business is held by a single person who is responsible for all business dealings, obligations, and legal proceedings. The majority of business losses are deductible from your return when you file personal taxes as a sole proprietor. These firms frequently only have one owner and one employee, who is also the sole proprietor. A sole owner may choose not to register their firm depending on the laws of the state governing business goods or services. If they run their own business, independent contractors like web designers, copywriters, or consultants might identify as sole proprietors.
2. General Partnership Two or more people who hold a general partnership are responsible for the financial and legal aspects of their company's operations. In a general partnership, the small business owners share liability equally but may receive varying amounts of compensation depending on the provisions of their individual partnership agreement about capital, contributions, and shares. General partners can deduct the majority of business losses from their personal tax returns, just like a sole proprietorship can. Together with their personal taxes, general partners also have to file self-employment taxes. Business owners in the same industry, such as developers, doctors, or attorneys, may benefit from this type of relationship. It could be simpler to apply for and obtain company loans with two owners because these small enterprises have several proprietors. 3. Limited Partnership An LP is comparable to a general partnership but divides the financial and legal duties between the general and limited partners. A general partner manages daily affairs and retains personal liability for commercial dealings and legal issues. Limited partners contribute to the operational funding of their small firm but have little to no management involvement. In an LP, investors can act as limited partners without being liable for the management of the business or any potential liabilities. Restricted partners might also pay less in taxes due to their limited involvement. Doctors' offices or legal companies may benefit from a limited partnership because the liability is limited to the individual, not to the business as a whole. 4. Limited Liability Company an LLC enables business owners to have one or more owners who are not personally liable for business activities without any danger to their personal property. There may be state-specific filing fees and potential biennial fees when forming an LLC. LLCs give small business owners the option of filing their corporation taxes and self-employment taxes separately from their business taxes or as part of their personal taxes. Owners of LLCs may report profits and losses on their personal tax returns. LLC owners are not required to divide gains or losses equally, depending on their ownership agreement. The LLC business structure can include broad or limited forms of partnerships. 5. Nonprofit A nonprofit makes money that is used for organizational expansion and other operating expenses. These organizations constantly provide resources and support for initiatives that benefit the local community. Nonprofits strive to build a network of donors or financial backers to assist them with business development projects, such as a public service or product. Nonprofit organizations are eligible for tax exemptions and other government aid programs because they don't make a profit from their operations. Nonprofits adhere to particular operational guidelines in order to preserve their position as nonprofit organizations due to nonprofit tax exemptions. As part of tax application and documentation paperwork, it's crucial to keep complete and accurate records of revenues and operational costs. 6. C Corporation One or more owners of a C Corporation are not held personally accountable for the small firm. With the potential for double taxation, this type of corporation enables owners to submit their small business taxes at the corporate level for tax deductions. Owners of a C Corporation have access to more tax deductions and can pay less in self-employment taxes. 7. S Corporation 1 to 100 U.S. residents are allowed to own an S Corporation. In an S-corporation, owners can file their personal tax returns along with their corporate tax returns. A business can keep the liability protections of a corporation while avoiding the potential for double taxation on dividends. How to Write a Business Plan Step-by-Step Step. Welcome to this informative video on how to write a business plan step-by-step. Step. If you're a business owner or an aspiring entrepreneur, having a business plan is critical to your success. A business plan is a comprehensive document that outlines your company's goals, strategies, and tactics. It provides a roadmap for achieving your objectives, and it's essential for securing funding, managing growth, and staying on track. In this video, we'll explain the critical importance of having a business plan and provide you with a step-by-step -step guide on how to write one. Firstly, having a business plan is important because it serves as a roadmap for your company's success. It outlines your goals and strategies, and provides a clear direction for achieving them. In fact, according to a study by the University of Oregon, Entrepreneurs who write formal plans are 16% more likely to achieve viability than those who don't. Additionally, businesses with plans grow 30% faster than those without, according to a study by the Small Business Administration. Secondly, a business plan is necessary for securing funding. 
Lenders and investors need to see a detailed plan before they'll consider investing in your business. A survey by the National Small Business Association found that 73% of small businesses used financing to start their businesses, and lenders were more likely to approve funding when a detailed business plan was provided. Now that we've covered why having a business plan is important, let's go through the seven steps to writing one. Step 1. Executive Summary the executive summary is the first section of your business plan, but it should be written last. It's a brief overview of your company's goals and strategies, and it should be written in a way that entices the reader to continue reading. Your executive summary should include a brief description of your company, the problem you're solving, your target market, and your financial projections. Step 2. Company Description In the Company Description section, you'll provide a detailed overview of your company. This includes information on your products or services, your target market, and your unique selling proposition. You should explain how your company will stand out from competitors and why customers will choose your business. Step 3. Market Analysis The Market Analysis section should provide a comprehensive analysis of your target market. This includes the size, demographics, and psychographics of your ideal customer. You'll also need to research your competitors and analyze their strengths and weaknesses. Step 4. Organization and Management In this section, you'll describe your organizational structure and management team. This includes the roles and responsibilities of each team member, their background and experience, and their qualifications for the job. You'll need to explain how your team will work together to achieve your company's goals. Step 5. Product or Service Line the product or service line section should provide a detailed description of your products or services. This includes information on how they will be produced or delivered, pricing strategies, and any patents or intellectual property rights. You'll also need to explain how your products or services will solve your customers' problems. Step 6. Marketing and Sales The marketing and sales section should outline your marketing and sales strategies. This includes how you plan to reach your target market and convert them into customers. You should also explain your advertising and promotion strategies, and how you plan to measure the success of your marketing campaigns. Step 7. Financial Projections The Financial Projections section should provide a detailed analysis of your expected revenue, expenses, and profits over the next 3 to 5 years. You'll need to include a cash flow statement, balance sheet, and income statement. It's important to be realistic with your projections and to explain how you plan to use the funds you raise to achieve your goals. When writing your business plan, it's important to keep in mind that it should be a living document that can be revised and updated as your business grows and evolves. It's not something you write once and forget about, it's a tool that should be used to guide your business decisions and track your progress. In conclusion, having a business plan is critical to the success of your business. It provides a roadmap for achieving your goals, helps you secure funding, and keeps you on track as your business grows. By following the seven steps outlined in this video, you'll be able to write a comprehensive and effective business plan that will set you on the path to success. Thank you for watching our video on how to write a winning business plan. If you found this information useful, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more helpful tips and advice. Hey, badass business owners. Today, we're going to talk about the basics of your profit and loss income statement, because let's face it, it can be very confusing because it looks like just a bunch of numbers on a page. But I want to let you know that you need to know your business numbers and your profit and loss is your business's report card. So it's really important you understand it because at the end of the day, it is the piece of the puzzle that helps you unlock your profits. So with that, let's take a look. Now there's going to be a couple different versions of a PNL that are out there. Don't get hung up on the way that yours happens to look. They all have the exact same five key sections. And that's what we're going to take a look at. So you know what those five sections are. The first section is the income line. And the income section is going to be called either income, sales, or revenue. Basically, it's all the money that is coming in to the business. So if you're receiving money in any way, shape or form, it's going to be right here under the income section. Once again, it'll say sales revenue. Everyone is a little bit different, but most of the time it's going to be called income. 
The second section that you need to worry about is your cost of goods. This is one of the big ones, and this is probably where most people make their mistakes. And on other videos, I dive into this section in detail to show you where those mistakes happen, but we'll take a look here real quickly. Cost of goods is sometimes called COGS. So when you hear people talk about COGS or COGS, what they're referring to is the cost of goods sold. And this is all money spent on materials, ingredients, packaging, and labor that is spent on creating the product or providing the service. There's different types of labor, and I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. But for cost of goods, just think of it this way. If it is part of providing the product at all, either making it or providing it if you're a service-based business, it's going to be under cost of goods. Because really what you're selling as a service is the actual service, which is the install, which is the service. If you have products and you make those products, then you're going to have a higher cost of goods because you're going to have to include the labor because you cannot make it without that person. Uh, if you just turn and you resell it, then it's just the original cost to you to purchase that material. Now, let me explain the labor hours a little bit better here because some people have them under cost of goods, some people have them under expenses. And the right answer is both, depending upon what you're using it for. Your cost of goods section is going to have the labor if the product or service cannot be done without the labor. So for example, if I buy a bicycle and I turn around and resell it, I'm only going to have the bicycle part itself. I'm not gonna have labor because nobody had to put that bike together. But if I buy the parts to the bike and I have to have labor to assemble the bike, then yes, it's going to be included in cost of goods. So the labor would be included. If I install ceiling fans, not only am I going to have the ceiling fan if I provide it, but I'm also going to have the labor hours to install it because what people are paying for is the install of the ceiling fan. However, it'll go under expenses if that labor supports the business. For example, it's office, cashiers, schedulers, someone who's doing the bidding, people who basically are not necessarily installing the product or creating or making the product. So you will have labor in both areas depending upon what it is. And by the way, this also includes you because you are a lot of times the only employee in your business or you are one of the employees in your business even though you don't necessarily have a payroll. Because remember, you get paid two different ways in your business. The first one is as an employee for work done, which I call it at a fair wage. You're not paying yourself 50 bucks an hour. If you would hire someone off the street for 15, 20, 25 bucks, you're going to pay yourself as an employee in your business at a fair wage. And then you also get paid as the business owner. However, your business owner pay really doesn't occur until the business has a profit. And then you are paid out of the success of the business through the profits. And I'm going to show you more on that here when we get to that section. So when you're looking at it, keep that in mind. Now, the third section is a little tiny line that says gross profit. And your gross profit is basically your sales minus your cost of goods. It's the money that's left over for all other business expenses, retained earnings, taxes, and owner's draw. So what you do is you just take your sales minus those cost of goods, and that's going to tell you what your gross profits are. So a lot of times when you hear people talking, they'll talk about their gross profits. What they're referring to is the money they've made prior to paying anything else that they owe in the business. So gross profits, some people have a very high gross profit line. Some people have a very low. What matters is what you take home at the end of the day, which I'm going to show you here in a minute. Now, let's just take an example here in this particular P&L. It's $36,000. we are in sales. The cost of goods were $17,000, which means their gross profit is the eighteen eight seventy three. So that's basically how gross profit line works. The next big section is the operational expenses. And this is going to have a lot of stuff under it, as you can see here. It's basically going to be all the other operational expenses to run the business. So whether it's advertising, it's repairs and maintenance to the truck, to your equipment, credit cards, insurance. Now you'll see payroll on here. It's not only for the people that are part of payroll, but you're going to have a payroll service in a lot of cases, in which case all the fees and taxes and things that you have to collect for payroll will be an operational expense because those are parts of owning the business for running the business, which is why they're under operational expenses, rent, small equipment, uniforms, stuff like that. So basically it's a catch-all for everything else that has is not part of your cost of goods. Now, the final section is called profits. And this is the line we all love to see and we want to see a nice healthy one. Uh, sometimes it'll say profit, sometimes it'll say net income. Just know that they are the same thing. At the end of the day, they are the business's profits. Now keep in mind, it's the money the business made, not necessarily you. Yes, you are the business, but the business still has business to do, if you will. All right. The business has to spend this money on a few things before you can start taking money out of it. And that's where this comes in. 
it's going to go to three things. First off, you've got to pay your taxes. It is money the business pays on the profits of the business and any money that you take out of the business because most of you are solopreneurs and you're going to take money out of the business so you're going to owe taxes. So you need to make sure that you set aside enough taxes out of those profits to pay for all those taxes. The next thing you're going to have to do is have some retained earnings. And this is money that you take out of those profits and retain it in the business to invest for the future growth. Like maybe you need to buy some more inventory. Maybe you need to build up three to six months of emergency fund. Whatever the case may be, you want to buy a special equipment. Those are retained earnings. That's money you keep in the business. And then if after you saved your money for your taxes and your retained earnings, there's money, then there's what's called an owner's draw. And this is the money that you take out of the business. Some people choose to leave all of the money in the retained earnings. Some people choose to take all of the money. The one mistake you want to make sure you don't make is that you spend all the money that is supposed to be for taxes. Please make sure you take at least 20 to 30% off the top of these uh, profits. Set it aside in a separate account because it's going to save your hide. It's one of the biggest mistakes small business owners make is they don't pay their taxes. So you want to make sure all those profits you're saving for that. Now, your PL statement is basically the flow of money through your business. As you can see, we started off with sales, then we went to cost of goods, and then what we did is we took off the expenses, and finally we ended up with our profits. This is the number one calculation that I tell people that they need to know. Sales minus cost of goods minus expenses equals profits. You're gonna notice already that this is how the flow of your PL goes. I don't have gross margin in here because all it is doing is telling you a snapshot between the sales and the cost of goods. The reason I want you to memorize sales minus cost of goods minus expenses minus profits, those were the big buckets of where money was coming out of the business as it was flowing through the business. And what we saw is it's a huge deal on your profit and loss statement. But guess what? When you price your products and your services, your PL will hold the key to you pricing correctly because when you spend money, since your top line is sales, every sale you make, every product you sell, service that you sell, will have the same flow of money through it. So if you always remember sales minus cost of goods minus expenses equals profits, you can actually set your pricings to ensure that you're going to have some profit. It's also a great tool to see if you can afford something, like if you wanna hire some people, get, get some equipment, some advertising, it's another great tool that you can use. And by the way, I have a bunch of videos on your PNL where I walk through each of these different scenarios to show you how you can use this but today, all we're trying to do is make sure that you can understand the basics of your profit and loss statement. And just remember, you have these four sections, right? You have your sales minus your cost of goods minus your expenses equals your profits. And yes, we can sit there and we do have, let me get my little mouse over there. We do have the gross profit line. All it is is just letting you know the difference between these two here. But your four main sections are sales minus cost of goods minus expenses equals those profits. And if you're a small business owner, you might watch some other videos and there's a lot of other little lines in here. Uh, trust me, at your size, you're not dealing with all those. The only things you really need to remember are sales must, cost of goods, must, expenses must, profits. When you start to hit the big time, we can teach you about all those other fun lines that you hear, the IBITAs and all that other stuff that people talk about. Uh, it's just basically this thing on steroids and you can learn that as you become bigger and bigger. But for now, the vast majority of you and 99% of what you do anyways is sales must, cost of goods, must, expenses equals profits. Uh, now let's take a quick example of the pricing like I was telling you. Let's say you sell something for $50. You know your cost of goods run you about $25. You know that you need to set aside about $10 in expenses. Your PL, by the way, will tell you that because your PL will have a percentage of what your expenses typically run, in which case you can take the sales price of $50 times that percentage. In this case, let's say their expenses ran 20%. This business owner knows that $10 is going to have to be set aside to pay their expenses. Now they know that their profit on this particular item is going to be $15. I know that sounds really confusing if you're watching my videos for the very first time, but I promise you if you watch the profit and loss videos and the pricing videos, this will make a lot of sense. Uh, now your PL, it's basically telling you the story of your business. At the end of the day, you don't just hand a book over to a kid and tell them to read it. No, you're going to show them, teach them the alphabet. You're going to teach them how to spell a word. Then you're going to teach them how to put a sentence together to read a book. Well, your numbers are the same way. We want to make sure that you understand those numbers because once you understand the numbers and how they look on that piece of paper and what they're telling you, you then can start seeing the story of your business and it starts telling you all kinds of really, really 
cool stuff. Matter of fact, you can get your PL by month. You can do it by year. You can compare this year to last year, month to month, and it's going to tell you all kinds of really cool stuff about your business and how you can make more money. Because you can look for trends, you can compare the year prior, you can view seasonality, you know, when your best months are, when your lowest months are. You can set aside profit for one time of the year versus another. It's really cool. It really is the key to you uh, earning more profit. So it's really important that you understand your profit and loss statement. Uh, don't complain if you don't have any profits. If you don't have any profits and you're not doing anything about it, then that's really on you because you really need to understand your business numbers. Because after all, didn't you want to create a business, not just a job? And when you don't know your business numbers, really all you're doing is creating a job for yourself. Because yeah, you're making sure you get paid, but you don't really know if the business is making you any money. Uh, you're just ensuring that you're getting paid as an employee. And we want you to be business owners and really understand understand how that works. And by the way, like I said, if you like what you see, don't forget to hit subscribe, hit the like button, all that cool stuff. But more importantly, make sure you watch some of these other videos that are on the screen where we take a deeper dive into your profit and loss statement, and it's going to help you out tremendously. I'll see you on the next video. Your Google Business Profile, the key to online success. Welcome to our video on Google Business Profile. The Google Business Profile is a key to your online success because it helps maximize your local business's online presence. As a local business owner, it's important to understand the value of having a strong online presence in today's digital world. According to a survey by Bright Local, 96% of consumers use the internet to search for local businesses and 85% of them trust online reviews as much as personal recommendations. A Google Business Profile is a free listing on Google that allows customers to find information about your business, such as your hours of operation, contact information, and reviews. By setting up a Google Business Profile, you can increase your visibility on Google Search and Maps, allowing potential customers to find your business more easily. Additionally, a well-optimized profile can improve your search rankings, making it more likely for your business to appear at the top of search results. Furthermore, having a Google Business Profile also enables you to engage with your customers and build trust through reviews. According to a study by Review Trackers, 72% of consumers say they will only take action after reading a positive review. So, it's essential that you have a Google Business Profile that is up-to-date and actively managed to make the most of the benefits it can bring to your business. In this video, we'll be walking you through the process of setting up and optimizing a Google Business Profile, as well as how to manage it effectively to drive more customers to your business. So, stay tuned as we show you how to take your local business to the next level with a Google Business Profile. 2. Setting up a Google Business Profile a. Step-by-step -step instructions for creating a Google Business Profile 1. Go to google.com slash business 2. Click on Start Now 3. Sign into your Google account or create a new one 4. Enter your business name and address 5. Verify your business by phone or mail 6. Complete the profile by adding your business hours, contact information, and photos b. Importance of providing accurate and complete information. It's crucial to provide accurate and complete information when setting up your Google Business Profile. According to a survey by Moz, businesses that have complete and accurate information on their Google My Business listing are more likely to be considered reputable by consumers. Also, Google uses this information to validate your business and show it in the right search results and maps. Therefore, make sure to double-check that all your information is correct and up-to-date, including your business name, address, phone number, website, and hours of operation. C. Tips for optimizing your profile. 1. Add high-quality photos. According to Google, businesses with photos receive 42% more requests for driving directions on Google Maps and 35% more click-throughs to their websites. 2. Encourage reviews. Positive reviews can have a significant impact on your business's online reputation and search rankings. According to a survey by Bright Local, 84% of people trust online reviews as much as personal recommendations. 3. Respond to reviews. Responding to reviews shows that you value your customers and care about their experience. 
By following these steps and tips, you'll be able to set up a Google business profile that effectively represents your business and helps attract more customers. Remember, a well-optimized and accurate Google business profile is essential for local businesses looking to improve their online presence and search rankings. 3. Managing your Google business profile. A explanation of how to update your business information and respond to reviews. It's important to regularly update your business information on your Google business profile to ensure that it remains accurate and relevant. You can make updates to your business information by logging into your Google My Business account and editing the details. Also, it's important to monitor and respond to reviews left by customers on your profile. According to a study by Bright Local, businesses that respond to reviews see an average rating increase of one point. Responding to reviews shows that you value your customers and care about their experience. B. Tips for keeping your profile active and engaging with customers. 1. Post regular updates. Use the Posts feature on Google My Business to share updates about your business, such as new products or services, promotions, or events. 2. Create a Google My Business Q&A section. This can be a great way to provide useful information to customers and improve their experience with your business. 3. Use Google My Business Insights to track your profile's performance. Google My Business Insights provides data on how customers are interacting with your profile, such as how many views your profile is getting and where your customers are coming from. C. How to use Google My Business Insights to track and analyze your profile's performance. Google My Business Insights provides data on how customers are interacting with your profile, such as how many views your profile is getting how many searches included your business, and how many actions such as phone calls or website clicks were made from your listing. By analyzing this data, you can gain insights into how customers are finding and interacting with your business and make informed decisions about how to optimize your profile for better results. By managing your Google business profile effectively, you can ensure that your business information is accurate and up-to-date, and that you are engaging with customers in a meaningful way. This will help improve your online presence and search rankings, and ultimately drive more customers to your business. 4. Enhancing your online presence with Google My Business A explanation of how Google My Business can help improve your online visibility. Google My Business is a powerful tool for local businesses looking to enhance their online presence. By setting up and optimizing your business profile, you can appear in Google Maps and search results for relevant keywords, which can help drive more customers to your business. Additionally, Google My Business allows you to share updates, photos, and other information about your business, which can help customers learn more about your business and decide to visit or make a purchase. B. Examples of how Google My Business can be used to boost online visibility. 1. Appearing in Google Maps When customers search for businesses like yours on Google Maps, your business will appear on the map, complete with your business information, photos, and reviews. This can be a great way to get more visibility and drive more foot traffic to your business. 2. Google My Business Posts This feature allows you to share updates, promotions, and events with customers. These posts appear in the knowledge panel of your Google My Business profile and can help increase engagement and drive more customers to your business. 3. Google My Business Q&A. This feature allows customers to ask questions about your business and for you to provide answers. This can be a great way to provide useful information to customers and improve their experience with your business. C. Importance of monitoring and optimizing your Google My Business profile. Monitoring and optimizing your Google My Business profile is essential for ensuring that your business appears in the right search results and that customers are finding the information they need. According to a study by Moz, businesses that have complete and accurate information on their Google My Business listing are more likely to be considered reputable by consumers. Additionally, monitoring and optimizing your profile will allow you to make data-driven decisions about how to improve your online visibility and drive more customers to your business. By using Google My Business to enhance your online presence, you can increase your visibility in local search results, engage with customers, and ultimately drive more traffic and sales to your business.
it's important to monitor and optimize your profile regularly to ensure that you are getting the best results possible. V. Conclusion in conclusion, setting up and managing a Google My Business profile is a crucial step for any local business looking to improve their online presence and drive more customers to their business. By creating a complete and accurate profile, you can appear in local search results and Google Maps, making it easier for customers to find your business. Additionally, by regularly updating your profile and engaging with customers through features like posts and Q&A, you can build trust and credibility with your audience. It's important to remember that setting up a profile is just the first step. In order to truly maximize the benefits of Google My Business, you'll need to regularly monitor and optimize your profile. Use the insights provided by Google My Business to track your performance and make data-driven decisions about how to improve your online visibility. Keep in mind that the competition is fierce, and the online market is constantly changing so it's important to stay on top of your game and adjust your strategy accordingly. By putting in the effort to create and manage a strong Google My Business profile, you'll be setting your business up for success and standing out from the competition. In short, Google My Business is the tool that can help you reach the right audience, at the right time and place, and help you to grow your business. It can help you to connect with your customers and build trust and credibility ultimately leading to more customers and more sales. So go ahead and set up your Google My Business profile today and start reaping the rewards of a stronger online presence. Thank you for watching this video on the importance of a Google Business profile. Please like and share. We also invite you to subscribe to our channel, Successful Businesses, so that you do not miss any of our upcoming informational videos for entrepreneurs like you. Welcome to the ultimate guide to finding the best payroll software for small businesses. Running a small business comes with a lot of responsibilities, and one of the most important is managing payroll. But with so many options on the market, how do you know which payroll software is the best fit for your business? In this video, we'll take a closer look at 9 key factors you need to consider when selecting the perfect payroll software for your small business. 1. Ease of use. First and foremost, you want to make sure that the software is user-friendly and easy to navigate. The last thing you want is to spend hours trying to figure out how to use the software instead of focusing on running your business. Look for software with a simple and intuitive interface that allows you to easily input employee information and process payroll. 2. Features. Next, consider the features the software offers. Think about the specific needs of your business and look for software that can accommodate those needs. For example, do you need to track employee time and attendance? Do you need to handle multiple pay schedules? Make sure the software you choose has the necessary features to support your business. 3. Integration Another key factor to consider is integration. Can the software integrate with other programs or systems that you already use? This can save you time and make it easier to manage your payroll and other business operations. Look for software that can integrate with accounting programs, time and attendance systems, and other tools. 4. Support Make sure the software has a good support system in place. You want to make sure that if you have any questions or issues, you can get the help you need quickly and easily. Look for software with a dedicated support team that can assist you with any issues that may arise. 5. Scalability As your business grows, you'll need a payroll system that can grow with you. Look for software that can handle an increasing number of employees and payrolls without becoming cumbersome or difficult to manage. 6. Compliance Payroll laws and regulations can vary by state and country. Make sure the software you choose is compliant with all relevant laws and regulations and that it can handle the specific requirements of your business location.
7. Cost. Payroll software can vary in price, so make sure you find a solution that fits within your budget. Consider not just the upfront cost of the software, but also any additional costs that may be associated with using it, such as monthly subscription fees or transaction costs. 8. Security. With sensitive employee information being stored and processed, security is a crucial factor when selecting payroll software. Look for software that offers robust security features such as encryption, multi-factor authentication, and regular security updates. 9. Mobile access. In today's digital age, many employees are mobile and it's important for a payroll software to have a mobile-friendly interface or an app that allows employees to access their pay stubs, request time off, and more from their mobile devices. By taking these additional factors into account, you can be sure to find a payroll software solution that fully meets the needs of your small business and is well-suited to your company's growth trajectory. Conclusion In summary, when choosing the best payroll software for your small business, it's important to consider factors such as ease of use, features, integration, support, scalability, compliance, cost, security, and mobile access. By taking these factors into account, you can be sure to find a payroll software solution that fully meets the needs of your small business. We hope you have found this video to be useful. If so, we invite you to like it and also subscribe to our channel to make sure you have access to many more videos we produce focused on helping businesses become successful. Thanks for watching and good luck with your search. How to build a high performing team and foster a positive company culture. Thank you for watching this video. Hang on as we get started. Welcome back to our channel. Today, we're going to dive deep into 10 essential points that will help you build a high-performing team and create an amazing company culture. We've got real-life examples and solid evidence from top-notch sources to back up these points. So, let's get started. Clear Vision and Mission A clear vision and mission statement helps align everyone's goals and creates a sense of purpose. Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, source, google.com. This shared goal helps drive innovation and teamwork. A study in the Journal of Applied Psychology revealed that teams with a clear purpose are more motivated, committed, and successful, source, Burson et al., 2015. As an entrepreneur, take time to craft a meaningful mission statement and ensure that your team members understand and embrace it. Effective communication. Open and honest communication is the foundation of high performing teams. At Pixar, they have brain trust meetings where they give candid feedback and critiques. Source Catmull, 2014. This fosters trust, collaboration, and continuous improvement. An MIT study found that communication patterns are the most important predictor of a team's success. Source Pentland, 2012. Encourage open dialogue, provide platforms for sharing ideas, and practice active listening to improve communication within your team. Embrace diversity. Diverse teams bring a variety of perspectives, experiences, and problem-solving approaches. Global management consulting firm McKinsey found that companies with greater diversity are more likely to outperform their peers. Source, Hunt, Leighton and Prince, 2015. As an entrepreneur, prioritize diversity in your hiring practices and promote an inclusive work environment. Empower your team. Empowered teams are more motivated, engaged, and productive. Atlassian, a leading software company, hosts Ship It Days where employees are free to work on any project they're passionate about. Source, Atlassian.com. Research shows that empowering employees leads to better job satisfaction and higher performance, source, Spritzer, 1995. Foster a culture where team members can take initiative, make decisions, and learn from their experiences. Provide growth opportunities. Continuous learning and development help teams stay innovative and adaptive. Companies like Amazon offer extensive training and development programs for their employees, source, Amazon.com. A Gallup report showed that employees who feel they're growing are more engaged and perform better, source, Gallup, 2016. Invest in your team's growth through training, mentoring, and skill development initiatives. Establish clear goals and expectations. Clear goals and expectations help teams stay focused and aligned. 
The SMART framework is a popular method for setting specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound goals, source, Doran, 1981. Evidence suggests that goal-setting improves team performance, source, Locke and Latham, 2002. Collaborate with your team to set ambitious yet realistic goals and regularly review progress. Recognize and reward achievements. Celebrating success boosts morale and reinforces a performance-driven culture. Tech giant Adobe uses a recognition platform to encourage peer-to-peer -peer appreciation, source, adobe.com. Studies show that recognition is a powerful driver of employee engagement and retention, source, Aon Hewitt, 2012. Implement a recognition system to celebrate individual and team accomplishments. Promote work-life balance. Balanced teams are happier, healthier, and more productive. Netflix's unlimited vacation policy is an example of promoting work-life balance, source, netflix.com. Research shows that companies with a good work-life balance experience lower turnover rates and higher job satisfaction, source, Cossack, Falcor and Lirio, 2014. Encourage flexibility, set reasonable workloads, and respect personal time to support work-life balance for your team. Encourage collaboration and teamwork. High-performing teams work together effectively and leverage each other's strengths. At Spotify, they use squads, small, cross-functional teams that work together on projects, source, spotify.com. A study by the Institute for Corporate Productivity found that collaborative teams are more innovative and agile, source, Institute for Corporate Productivity, 2018. Foster a collaborative environment by promoting teamwork, breaking down silos, and encouraging cross-functional projects. Build trust and psychological safety. Trust and psychological safety are the cornerstones of successful teams. Google's Project Aristotle discovered that psychological safety was the most important factor in high-performing teams, source, Rozovsky, 2015. Harvard Business School professor Amy Edmondson's research shows that psychological safety fosters learning, innovation, and growth. Source, Edmondson, 1999. Cultivate trust and psychological safety by encouraging vulnerability, admitting mistakes, and creating a supportive, non-judgmental work environment. And there you have it. These are the 10 essential points to help you build a high-performing team and foster a positive company culture. Remember, your team is your greatest asset, so invest in them and create an environment where they can thrive. Thanks for tuning in, and if you found this video helpful, be sure to like, subscribe, and share it with fellow entrepreneurs. Until next time. Lead Generation Strategies for Small Business Thank you for watching this video. We are going to be discussing lead generation strategies for small businesses. Lead generation is a process of attracting potential customers and converting them into real customers who purchase your products or services. It's a crucial part of running a successful business, no matter how big or small. So, what are some lead generation strategies that small businesses can use to drive more sales? First, you should consider using paid digital advertising. Paid digital advertising is a great way to reach new audiences and generate leads. You can use platforms such as Google Ads, Facebook Ads, and YouTube Ads to reach your target audience. For example, Google Ads allows you to target specific keywords and audiences, while Facebook Ads can help you reach new audiences with custom audiences. Research from the Content Marketing Institute found that companies using paid digital advertising saw an average increase of 12% in leads. Second, you should focus on optimizing your website. Optimizing your website for lead generation is essential for driving more sales. You can use SEO tactics such as keyword research, content creation, and link building to improve your website's visibility and generate more leads. For example, you can use keywords to target specific search terms and create content that is optimized for those keywords. A study by Moz found that businesses using SEO saw an average increase of 6.5% in website traffic. Third, you should leverage the power of email marketing. 
Email marketing is another powerful tool that allows you to reach potential customers and generate leads. You can create newsletters, special offers, and other forms of communication to keep your customers engaged. For example, you can create automated emails that are tailored to the customer's needs and interests. According to research from Campaign Monitor, email marketing can generate up to $44 for every $1 spent. Fourth, you should consider using Facebook ads. Facebook ads is a great way to reach new audiences and generate leads. You can use Facebook ads to target your desired audience and get more leads. For example, you can use targeting options such as demographic data, interests, and behaviors to ensure that you are reaching the right people. According to research from a marketer, businesses using Facebook ads saw an average increase of 25% in leads. Fifth, you should focus on reputation marketing. Reputation marketing is the process of building trust and credibility with your customers. You can use customer reviews and testimonials, as well as engaging content, to improve your reputation and generate more leads. For example, you can use review sites such as Trustpilot and Yelp to gather customer feedback and create content that resonates with your target audience. According to research from Bright Local, businesses that use reputation management saw an average increase of 15% in leads. Sixth, you should leverage the power of YouTube video marketing. YouTube video marketing is a great way to reach new audiences and generate leads. You can create engaging content and optimize your videos for SEO to reach your target audience and generate more leads. For example, you can use keywords and tags to optimize your videos and create content that appeals to your target audience. A study by Think with Google found that businesses using YouTube video marketing saw an average increase of 10% in leads. So, there you have it, 6 lead generation strategies for small businesses. These strategies can help you create more leads, increase your sales, and build relationships with potential customers. Recent studies have shown that these strategies are effective. For example, one study found that businesses that use paid digital advertising saw an average increase of 12% in leads, while businesses using SEO saw an average increase of 6.5% in website traffic. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, comment and share. Also, we invite you to subscribe to our channel, Successful Businesses, which offers informational videos for entrepreneurs like you. Do you know how to get more repeat customers? 10 Proven Tips to Boost Repeat Business and Increase Customer Loyalty As a business owner, you likely already know that it's much more cost-effective to retain existing customers than it is to acquire new ones. Repeat customers not only spend more money with your business over time, but they also help to generate positive word-of-mouth marketing. Repeat customers are vital for the growth and success of any business. Here are some verifiable facts that demonstrate the importance of repeat customers. According to a study by Invesp, it is up to 25 times more expensive to acquire a new customer than it is to retain an existing one. Repeat customers tend to spend 67% more than new customers according to a study by the White House Office of Consumer Affairs. A study by Frederick Reich held, a Bain & Company consultant, found that a 5% increase in customer retention can lead to a 25-95% to increase in profit. Repeat customers are also more likely to refer others to your business. According to a study by Nielsen, 92% of consumers trust recommendations from people they know, and 70% of consumers trust online reviews. Additionally, repeat customers can also act as brand advocates and help to promote your business through word-of-mouth marketing. Repeat customers are more likely to be satisfied with your products or services and are more likely to recommend your business to friends and family. All these facts together highlight the importance of repeat customers and the benefits it brings to a business. So, how can you get more repeat customers? 1. Provide excellent customer service. Make sure your customers have a positive experience every time they interact with your business. 2. Build a relationship with your customers. Take the time to get to know your customers and their preferences. 3. Offer personalized discounts and promotions. Reward your repeat customers for their loyalty. 4. Make it easy for customers to shop with you. Offer multiple payment options and make sure your website is user-friendly. 5. Use email marketing to stay in touch with your customers. 
send out regular newsletters, and special offers. 6. Encourage customers to leave reviews. Positive reviews can help attract new customers. 7. Use social media to engage with your customers. Respond to comments and messages, and share relevant content. 8. Go the extra mile. Surprise and delight your customers with unexpected perks and bonuses. 9. Listen to customer feedback. Use customer feedback to improve your products and services. 10. Show your appreciation. Thank your customers for their business and let them know how much you value them. By following these tips, you can increase customer loyalty and drive repeat business. Remember, repeat customers are the lifeblood of any successful business. Thanks for watching this video. We hope you found it informative and helpful. Please like and share and subscribe to our channel, Successful Businesses. Secrets of Closing the Sale, 7 Sales Tips by Zig Ziglar Thank you for watching this video. Hang on as we get started. Hello and welcome to this video on Secrets of Closing the Sale, 7 Sales Tips by Zig Ziglar. In this video, we'll be discussing the 7 major points made by Zig Ziglar in his classic book, Secrets of Closing the Sale, which has become an international bestseller and has been a must-read for anyone running a business. We will take a look at seven of the top tips made by Ziegler. The first point is the importance of building rapport with your prospect. Ziegler emphasizes the importance of building a relationship with your potential customer before attempting to make a sale. By taking the time to understand their needs, wants, and preferences, you can tailor your sales pitch to their specific situation. An example of this is a car salesman who asks a potential customer about their driving habits, lifestyle, and budget before recommending a vehicle that meets their needs. As Ziegler puts it, If people like you, they'll listen to you, but if they trust you, they'll do business with you. The second point is the power of active listening. Ziegler emphasizes the importance of listening to your prospect and truly understanding their needs. By listening actively, you can identify pain points and objections that may be preventing the sale. An example of this is a real estate agent who listens to a client's concerns about finding a home with a large backyard and quiet neighborhood before suggesting properties that meet those criteria. As Ziegler says, listen to learn, not to reply. The third point is the importance of asking for the sale. Ziegler encourages salespeople to be assertive and ask for the sale. He argues that many sales are lost because the salesperson never actually asked for the order. Ziegler recommends using trial closes to gauge the prospect's interest and move them closer to making a decision. An example of this is a software salesperson who asks a potential customer if they're ready to sign up for a free trial after demonstrating the product's features and benefits. As Ziegler puts it, If you don't ask for the sale, you won't get it. The fourth point is the importance of handling objections. Ziegler stresses that objections are a natural part of the sales process and should be viewed as an opportunity to address the prospect's concerns. He recommends acknowledging the objection, asking clarifying questions, and providing evidence to counter the objection. An example of this is a financial advisor who addresses a client's concern about the risks of investing in the stock market by explaining the historical performance of a diversified portfolio. As Ziegler says, Objections are not rejections. They are simply requests for more information. The fifth point is the power of emotional appeals. Ziegler argues that people make buying decisions based on emotions rather than logic. He recommends using stories and anecdotes to appeal to the prospect's emotions and create a connection. An example of this is a clothing salesperson who tells a customer a story about how a particular outfit made them feel confident and successful before suggesting a similar outfit for the customer. As Ziegler says, Logic makes people think but emotions make them act. The sixth point is the importance of following up. Ziegler stresses that following up with prospects is crucial for closing the sale. He recommends setting clear next steps and timelines for follow-up and staying in touch with the prospect until the sale is made. 
An example of this is a real estate agent who follows up with a potential buyer after a showing to answer any additional questions and schedule a second showing if necessary. As Ziegler says, timid salesmen have skinny kids. The final point is the importance of continuous learning and improvement. Ziegler emphasizes that sales is a constantly evolving field, and successful salespeople must be committed to continuous learning and improvement. He recommends attending sales training seminars, reading sales books, and seeking feedback to identify areas for improvement. An example of this is a sales manager who encourages their team to attend a sales conference to learn new techniques and strategies for closing sales. As Ziegler puts it, You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. In conclusion, Zig Ziglar's Secrets of Closing the Sale provides valuable insights and strategies for salespeople looking to improve their sales techniques. By building rapport with prospects, actively listening, asking for the sale, handling objections, using emotional appeals, following up, and committing to continuous learning, salespeople can become more effective at closing sales and achieving their goals. Thank you for watching this video on the seven major points made by Zig Ziglar in his book, Secrets of Closing the Sale. We hope you found this information helpful and informative. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more videos on sales, marketing, and business.